Welcome friends to another edition of TiffinCast. I'm your host Seishu and today I'm honored to speak with Dinesh Khanna, a photographer based in Gurgaon, India, which is a suburb of New Delhi. And Dinesh and I have been chatting back and forth on Facebook for a number of almost years now trying to get this interview going, but he's been on the move and I've been on the move and it's been wonderful to just connect finally. Thanks for joining us, Dinesh. Entirely my pleasure, Seishu. So let's start off from the very beginning. How did you get started in photography? Uh, do you want a long answer or a short answer? <laughs> because it's a bit of a story. Yeah, tell us a story. I love stories. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you a medium level answer, which uh, I think would, might you know, make it more interesting for people listening in. Uh, my father was a photographer. Huh. Right, so that meant that uh, you know I had access to cameras and film. I mean, this, of course, we're talking about the 1960s and 70s. Uh, so he used to work with the American Embassy, the U.S. Information Service. And so you know, I was brought up in a house where my father was a photographer, where there was a camera available. He used to you know allow me to use a camera to you know so there was film uh, from an early age. And we also had a dark room at home, so which used to encourage me to, you know, make my own prints. So let's say through high school and early college, uh, I had access to camera to be able to use it, which in India at that time was a very big thing because you know film was expensive, mm -hmm. cameras weren't, you couldn't import cameras, so you know people didn't really have uh, good cameras available to them. So that was a great learning, and my father was a very patient. He, you know, he didn't want to be a teacher. Uh, in a very obvious way, but he used to kind of nudge me along, you know, talk about pictures, show me pictures. Of course, the other interesting thing at that time was, you know, that unlike today, which I find actually very interesting that, you know, today's kids, since I teach now, uh, for instance, can't think of a situation where you didn't have the internet, where you couldn't pick up, you know, photographer's work off the website or off Facebook or off Flickr. Uh, at the top of a hat, you could just Google a person and knew what the hell the person was shooting and doing. Right. Uh, so you know, so that was a very important thing. Also, in the 60s and 70s, uh, the access to photography, the access to photographs. Uh, so it wasn't just about your learning how to shoot; it was also being able to find, uh, you know, photographs or work which you could be inspired by or were influenced by. Uh, okay, I'm going a bit roundabout, but you know, that's that's, that's the kind of you know. Uh, situation I came from and and it was as confused as I'm sounding uh, which means that you know I got to shoot myself got to see my own pictures occasionally saw my father's reaction to them uh, but he really didn't want to make too much of a comment but just wanted to encourage me to keep shooting whatever I wanted uh, including for instance you know when I was in my last year of school 18 years old first couple of years of college he let me take the camera and go off for weekend trips to nearby places like Haridwar and Rishikesh. And, uh, so, you know, my interest in photography and my interest in travel photography kind of grew because of that. Okay. All right. All right. Now, the interesting thing is that having, you know, lived my early years uh, with photography, I was very sure that I didn't want to be a photographer. And the reason for that was not photography. The reason was not that my father was a photographer, but the fact that India has what's called the caste system, where it's believed that whatever the father or the family's business or occupation is, that the son will take that on automatically. So if a father is a cobbler, the son becomes a cobbler. If the father has a business, the son joins the business. Right. If the father is an artisan, you know, the son becomes an artisan. Uh, and I was very against that entire system. I just felt that you know it, was, it should be a matter of choice for the individual to become what they ought to. And more than that, it was that you know the caste system by well now maybe the origins were different uh, was something which is more negative than positive. It wasn't seen really as the guru shishya parampara, which means the guru and the student tradition. Uh, which, as I grew older, I really thought that there was some merit in that. But it was that you were destined to be what your family was. Uh, and they, this included a lot of castes which were looked down upon, for instance. Uh, there were professions and livelihoods which were not supposed to be, you know, something which is to be looked up to. 
and certainly the kind of thing which people would say, oh God, that person just does that. Uh, so I wanted to escape from that. This was, you know, this is a 1920 year old logic, uh, which, but it was very real for me at that point of time. And I was quite a bit of a rebel uh, with other things too. So this was something which I had in my head. So anyway, I drifted out of, uh, you know, college, which I barely passed at my economics uh, graduation. I uh, was never a very good, good student, but uh, more interested in travel and the visual world and all that. And I had a couple of friends who were, you know, uh, doing a course in commercial art. And I used to hang out with them and uh, I just found what they were doing very fascinating. And that kind of introduced me to the world of advertising. Ah. And that's, that, that's the profession then which I went and joined. Uh, and I spent about a dozen years in advertising. Not as a creative person, but as a client servicing person. Uh, fortunately for me, did rather well in that, grew pretty fast, you know, went from being a trainee to being the director of the Delhi branch of a very well known creative agency of that time uh, in a matter of seven or eight years. Even ran that branch for five years. Uh, but, you know, about eight, nine years into the profession of advertising, it started feeling that this is not all I want to do with my life. That my first love and my, you know, continuing love is still photography. Mm -hmm. And some of that thing, you know, came back that that's what I would like to do even professionally. Uh, also, you know, the advertising business is the kind where it, uh, you know, takes over your life. Uh, it takes over your time, you know, the pressures and the timelines and the crises which you have to handle. Right other things which don't allow you to do anything else really. And uh, well, I was always a very conscientious type and since I was the manager also, you know, I was very steeped in running the damn business and everything, you know. So I, there came a time when I had to then say, ki, okay, do I want to continue this for the rest of my life or do I want to try and do something with my photography, which incidentally, at that time for the last three, four years of my being in advertising, uh, I wasn't doing any photography at all. I just didn't have the time or the energy. Uh, so that's what happened that around my early 30s, uh, the proverbial midlife crisis, which at 32 in my case probably was a bit early, but which is fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, kind of burnt out as far as the corporate world was concerned. And I said, hey, no, that's it. I want to be a photographer. So I quit that. And uh, well, people thought that it was a very brave, very courageous, very foolhardy, depending on what the person. Sure, uh, absolutely. This was, you know, like I said, I was, I was doing very well in advertising at that time. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people couldn't understand why the hell I would want to leave that and, you know, start afresh. But for me, the idea of starting afresh and starting as a photographer again uh, was something which I found very interesting. So that's how I became a photographer. Now, did you did you have a family already at that time? Did you have kids already at that time when you were making that change over? I was already married. I'd been married for about, I think, uh, five odd years, but I didn't have kids. And that's a very good question because that, I think, was an important point. Because once you're married, uh, you do, you know, become slower. Once you have kids, you also start feeling very responsible. So the entire thing of you know taking a risk of leaving something, especially if you're doing rather well and you know you're well established, you know, reason about money coming home, uh, then to take that risk and because you always want to you know make sure that you don't do something which will go against you know what your family's condition at that point is. Uh, so yes, that did make a difference. Secondly, my wife was very supportive. She herself was an advertising at that point of time. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, but we actually met in one agency uh, where we were working together. And, and that's how we met and then got married subsequently. But uh, she thought that, you know, if I really want to be a photographer, I really want to try it out, then, then why not? You know? Go ahead and Indeed. Now let's talk a little bit about the teaching portion of your life. I know you're an avid teacher. You, you've taught at the one school in Goa. Uh, you, you conduct workshops, I imagine, um, and I've heard you speak at, at a number of other events. Uh, you run, essentially, 
the premier photo festival in, in Delhi now, right? Um, and probably the country, probably the country, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's called the Delhi Photo Festival, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's right, yeah. Um, you, you seem to be so involved now in, in teaching the younger generation um, to be better photographers. Uh, why? why? Why spend the time to do that? Why, why that transfer of knowledge now? Uh, you know, while one's working full time as a professional, uh, there's so much you want to do for yourself, and there's only so much time, uh, you know, in a day or in a week. Uh, so, you know, for the first 20 odd years of being a professional photographer, I was, you know, it's assignments, it's timelines, it's, you know, it's also my, I do a lot of personal work, so, you know, uh, their interest in traveling and you know shooting for myself was always there. Uh, also, as far as photography education was concerned, it was never really a very serious kind of an endeavor in India. Uh, it never, you know, there were only a couple of photography schools, very few workshops, uh, and I think the reason for that was that you know, as far as long as analog photography was around and you know, uh, people were shooting on film. Uh, photography was such an expensive uh, hobby and even as a profession uh, that either you were rich to be able to afford it to be a hobby or you were a professional so that someone was paying for your film and your processing etc. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if photography was then paying for your own interest in photography if you were also doing any personal work, sure. that it would be virtually impossible for people to take it on as, you know, as just a hobby or just a passion. Uh, and I think that was one of the reasons why, it, you know, the education of photography never really took off as long as analog photography was around. Uh, ever since digital came along, uh, there has been an explosion in sheer camera ownership. So the first thing which happened with digital was that everyone felt, hey, you know, cameras are cheap now. Very importantly, the entry point into photography was the purchase of camera with no recurring cost. I think that is really what tipped the entire thing that, you know, earlier when you, you bought a camera, fine, but you had to buy film and then you had to pay for processing and then you had to make prints. Right. But right. with digital, and that's a huge change, all you had to do was to buy a camera and thereafter you didn't want to make prints, it didn't matter. You just shot, shot a picture, shot 100 pictures, shot 200 pictures, it didn't cost you anything, all right? So I think that's one of the reasons why it's really exploded in India and I think worldwide too. Mm -hmm. uh, the entire interest in photography and also therefore one of the reasons why photography has gone away from being, you know, really uh, a memory creator uh, in a more exalted way to being a memory creator in a more democratic way. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. What, I like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, for instance, even now when we come across that one photograph of my birthday when I was five years old, you know, that, that there's one print, the value of that one print and wanting to show it to my daughter or show, you know, put it up on, scan it somehow and put it up on Facebook is so much more than the 50 pictures we might shoot, you know, in a day, whether professionally, because that somehow seems more ephemeral. It's just something which is, is done, it's seen, it's gone. Hmm. Uh, but the discovery of a print from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, that physicality of that print, hmm. the exclusiveness of it being the only one or the only three, you know, there were never 50 of them. You know, there were never 100 of them. And even if you shot 50 pictures, which you never did, because like I said, film was expensive. Right. You didn't make that many prints. And even if you made that many prints, not that many prints survived in your house. You know, so it's, uh, that's the... The shift which has happened, right? So it's coming back to so therefore, uh, why my interest in you know uh, teaching? It's really I would say twofold. Therefore, one one's been in the business long enough. I find that I have more time now. Uh, I feel I've learned a lot on my own and through you know you know learning from other friends, other professionals. So there's a cachet of knowledge and more importantly of experience. Uh, I won't say knowledge, but experience on how to approach an assignment, how to do a certain kind of a job, and how to do still life, how to do food photography, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
photography has been my life for the last 25 30 years and you know i just feel that it's time to kind of give back to to photography so photography has made my life and i should give back to photography too so that's you know that's the other reason sure uh and what am i going to do with all this you know knowledge and experience you know just locked away in my own head or in my computer it's it's so much nicer to you know share it i i feel like that's that's a uh, a huge change in in um in philosophy and probably approach uh that was missing you know when whenever i talk to a photographer who you know, who's based in india who's who probably has not embraced uh, the digital medium as much, or has sort of remembers the film days as, as being one of those glory days of, of working in film, they, they're somewhat guarded about what they have done in the past. They're somewhat guarded about sharing their information. And it seems uh, quite refreshing to hear you say that you're trying to give back and you're, you've, you've, you've spent a good deal of time uh, learning certain things about photography and that it's time for you to to unload I guess uh, to or offload <laughs> that information to somebody who's coming up um, that's that, that seems to be a, a bit of a shift in my, at least in my in my psyche I feel like that's changing and that's that's changing for the better I think uh, I'm so happy to see you involved in, in the deadly photo festival and something that I've always wanted to come to uh, how did that start, really? I, mean, I know you've worked with uh, Mr. Panjiar uh, and, and others trying to bring that together, and it takes place every two years. Is that right? Yes, it's every seven years. Uh, doing it every year would, you know, just wreck us. It, it just takes a lot of effort, a I'm lot sure. of resources, you know, a lot of time. Uh, and since both Prashant and I are, uh, you know, working photographers, or at least working when we get assignments now, sure. which of course, you know, uh, that that's that's changed quite a lot. Both because photography per se as as a profession has changed dramatically. The entire monetization of photography changed a lot. Uh, to the fact that you know both of us are you know in our late fifties and you know there's only that much work you get or that much work you can do. Uh, so also the entire thing of Delhi Photo Festival. If we step back for a moment, uh, Prashant is a photojournalist. That's how he you know spent his 30, 30 40 years uh, in photography. And I'm a commercial photographer. So we actually are from two different parts of you know, right. the photography world. Uh, and in India, I don't know if, what, if it's true in the US or not. Uh, these are two worlds which actually you know, don't necessarily mix at all or even cross paths. Uh, uh, we happen to. And I think interestingly, it was uh, we had an exhibition together. It was a two photography exhibition in Delhi. Uh, and the subject was faith. And I have been shooting faith and religion and mm -hmm. spirituality. Uh, this has been one uh, personal obsession, if I can call it that. You have a book now, uh, right? You have a book. I have got, I've got, my second book uh, was called Living, Living Faith, faith right. which is on faith in India. Uh, so it was that work, and Prashant had you know, shot the Kumbh Mela. Uh, so we did a joint uh, exhibition. That's how we came to know each other. And when we got talking and, you know, then generally, you know, the, the environment in, in Delhi and India at that time was that, you know, by that time, almost every major city in the world was having so on photo festival. You know, whether it's London, whether it's Paris, whether it's New York, whether yeah. it's Tokyo, whether it's Dhaka, you know, which is next yes, door. Yes, yes. Uh, Chobi Mela. Probably the single most, yeah. Chobi Mela is the, probably the most important photo festival of the region. Mm -hmm. And a lot of you know young photographers would ask you know that why can't India have its own photo festival? Now the idea of Nazar, which we set up as a non-profit uh, foundation, was like I said earlier to give back to photography what we've got so much from the medium, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and to promote it as an art form. So the idea was to do seminars, to do talks, to you know, get into photography education. But at the time of starting Nazar Foundation, we hadn't really thought of doing a photo festival. That's something which kind of you know happened over the next year or so, uh, and really was out of this you know needling sense of you know if India is such a big country and such a large country and such an important country, if everyone else can have their own photo festival, why won't India have one of its own? Uh, so it really that's the starting point, 
and fortunately for us the india habitat center which is uh, you know a major cultural space in the heart of delhi uh, when prashant spoke to the curator there kapande she said wow what a great idea let's partner and we can host the delhi folk festival here which was great because it's, it's a very large space so a very architecturally and uh, so there we were and so we had the first photo festival in 2011 Uh, followed up with the two years later in 2013, and the next one's in October 2015. Okay. For even for which even as we talk, work has already started. We're going for a first meeting with one potential, you know, patron or sponsor tomorrow morning. Uh, we are already close to finalizing what the theme for next year's uh, episode should be. and we should be putting it out in public in the next i think two weeks or so so that people can start submitting what we're working on how long is the festival typically is it a week long festival or two weeks it's two weeks long two weeks okay. uh, so the 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 prints and the work is up uh, for two weeks at the habitat but we do what we call the opening week for a period of about 5 or 6 days uh, which is the time in which we do all the seminars the artist talks the workshops you know the portfolio reviews oh, wow. because that's you know that's like you know uh, bringing a lot of other activity mm-hmm. uh, but because you know there's a lot of people who do come from bombay and bangalore and calcutta and you know so uh, since they they're not here for the entire two week uh, period right. we try and Put a lot of that stuff into that five days, so that you know it's it's really worth everyone's while to be at the festival. Excellent. Uh, it it works very well. Um, speaking of other projects, uh, I know the Delhi Photo Festival is one of your bigger projects, but the other projects are are, are like the one about chairs, for instance, found chairs found in on the streets. Um, <laughs> Uh, as I've told you before, we start recording. Every time I see you post one, I I I, I laugh out loud because it just it just seems so so weird and so bizarre that you know you find a, a chair just all by itself in the middle of the street and and you found it uh, you found somewhat of a of a project out of it. You've created a project out of it by just just finding these random chairs and taking pictures of it. Why why chairs and how did you come upon your first chair? Uh, okay, I think this I need to put this into context. Uh, like I said, with you know, I'm from the analog age. Uh, one was shooting very precisely, very carefully with film. Then came along digital, so one was shooting more loosely and more uh, rampantly, I would say, <laughs> you know, with the uh, DSLR, etc. And then came along the iPhone camera, which meant there was a camera in your hand, and not just you know mine, but virtually everyone. And so suddenly, all of us are photographers. And photographers are also iPhone photographers, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm making that distinction here because the way I approach my photography with a DSLR is very different, including the subject which I want to shoot, from what I want to shoot with the camera on hand. And I'm using that term because it could be an iPhone, it could be a Samsung, that doesn't matter. Yeah. I just happen to be, you know, an iPhone user. Uh, so that's as far as. the context is concerned as the camera is concerned because there is a certain mindset you have with the kind of camera you have with you right i'm saying this for myself i'm not saying this the universe of truth but for me and I, because i've always thought you know why am i shooting these kind of things with this particular camera and not that and if i may just you know ramble a bit again uh, if i was to go back to the film years uh, one i shot 35 i shot 120 and i shot 4 by 5 uh one way clearly shot 35 use 35 for travel use 120 for studio work as far as you know still life is concerned or since i am an advertising photographer for pictures for images which would need to be blown up mm-hmm. and one shot with the 4x5 for still life which was more contemplative which required more time in terms of setting up uh whether it was a prop so whether it's the set whether it's the lighting so the camera in a way you know set the mood for what you were going to shoot or the mood you wanted to be in mm-hmm. you chose the interesting right? okay yeah so now if i was to take the analogy into today's world all dslrs are the same it's only in recent time that the mirrorless has come or the 3/4 has come or whatever but there's a huge 
difference between the DSLR and the iPhone camera. So the mood with which I shoot with either of them is totally different. I don't shoot the same pictures and nor do I shoot the same subjects and nor do I approach the same subjects in the same way. It depends a lot on the camera on hand. All right. All right. So that's as far as the phot photographer part is concerned. <laughs> uh, the chairs, I happen to shoot. I, I, I've been working on a project on Banaras, Varanasi for the last seven or eight years. I've been going there fairly regularly, or I should say irregularly, but I've been going there you know, over the years. I've already done about 16, 17 clips because uh, at some point I hope you know there will be a book at the end of it, my third book. Uh, so one morning I was coming out of the hotel I was staying in and I saw this you know uh, lovely but old kind of broken chair uh, sitting under a tree. And this was a flowering tree and there were these beautiful red flowers which had fallen on it wow. naturally from the tree, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And this broken down chair was chained. <laughs> so I, I was very taken by, you know, the the contradiction of something which looked useless and probably a castaway, but was chained, which meant it was, you know, valuable enough for someone right. to chain it so that it doesn't get stolen. So I couldn't make up a mind which it was. And then, of course, the beautiful red flowers on the chair sure. somehow add the majesty <laughs> of the moment. You, you couldn't pass that picture up, right? So, so it's, it's, <laughs> I'm probably you know, telling the story much better than the picture is, but anyway, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I shot that chair and I, and I, you know, even though I was carrying my DSLR, I happened to shoot that with my, with my phone camera. And that's the, that's the reason I was telling you the background to it, because I find that I shoot different things in sure. spite of having a camera with me, uh, with the different cameras. So through the day, for some reason, maybe because of the chair, I started noticing other chairs. And I know that in that particular day, I was walking around, whether it's the Thars, whether it's the narrow lane, whether it was you know, on the burning hearts, whatever it is. I shot about four different chairs in different kinds of situations. So there was the barber's chair on the heart, there was another broken up chair in one lane somewhere. All right, so that was the beginning of my chair fetish. Now let me add another aspect to this, you know, if I told you the photography and the camera aspect, and I told you about the chair, and the larger issue in my head was, many years ago, there was a film called Kissa Kursika, which came in India in the 70s. Now, if I may translate Kissa Kursika, it literally means the tail of the chair, okay? That's a literal, but very boring and meaningless translation. What it means colloquially is that the chair is the thing which gives political power or position to a person. Okay. 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 Uh, that's the way it is. I think it's, it's world over. That's the way it is. You know, you, you say the, the prime minister's chair, the president's chair. Sure. It's, it is. It is the seat of power. Sure. The seat of political power. Sure. Right. The film Kissa Kursika therefore was a political satire on power and how the chair was the thing which uh, held, the, held the power yearned for, yeah. and once they got onto it, misused to make the most of the time being in political power. So, coming back to now, for me, the chairs I was seeing and shooting subsequently were the lay person or the ordinary person or the arm army. The arm army is the ordinary person mm -hmm. uh, whose life is simple, can be broken down, can be neglected, as opposed to the thrones on which the political leaders sit. So it became my satire Indeed. on the political situation in India. Oh, wow. So what started off as, you know, being one interesting chair or two interesting chairs actually ended up being a series of 98 photographs. Oh, my. A phone. <laughs> and all of them on Facebook. There's an album there in case you want to see it. It's 98 of them. Uh, wow. And interestingly, the last picture, and which I just felt that this photograph is telling me it's time to go, and don't even go for the 100, 98 is good enough. <laughs> it's of a person, a lady, in a classroom full of empty chairs, where she's teaching one child. And I felt that this is 
the full cycle is completed. Yes, the closure. The who's got up from her chair behind the desk, has come to the student's chair, sat with the little kid to teach the child and help explain some problem the child was having. That is what the seat of power ought to be used for. Indeed. I love complicating things, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, t tell me, wh why, why, have you, why have you not considered a book on the chairs as a, as a, as a, as a project? I mean, you know, would it, would it sell, you think, uh, uh, in India or it's, abroad? Uh, I haven't thought of a book before. I, for, well, I tell you what, there, there's, uh, as far as books are concerned, there seems to be a problem as far as publishers are concerned and photography is concerned. Uh, the market seems to have evaporated for the publisher, right? Uh, which means that the photo book has died is the question. It doesn't seem to have, because what's happening is a lot of photographers are doing self-publishing. Right. And there are right. enough examples in India, you probably, you know Mahesh Bhatt, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, he's published, you know, two of his, or three, he's doing his third book now. Right. Or right. Sefi Burgesson is just, you know, self-publishing a book on Indian weddings. Right. Uh, and world awareness is a major phenomenon. Uh, the other thing, of course, is should the book be paper, should the book be ebook? Uh, I find for myself, for instance, that virtually anything I read, I'm reading off the damn iPad, including my newspaper. So therefore, should it be a book or not? Okay. Uh, so these are the questions about, you know, should it be a book or not? The other is, and this is another major difference between analog time and digital time, is earlier when you shot and filled and you made a few prints and you only made a few prints, there was a certain physical limitation to who you could share them with. Right. All right. You could show them to your friends, you could show them to other photographers. If you're lucky, you would have an exhibition. And if you were really lucky, you had a book. All right. So there was a value and a ceremony to the print and to the image, therefore. Today, by the time I've shot a picture and since I'm shooting with my iPhone, it's put up on Facebook in an album, you know. Two minutes later, I'm done. I've shared it. I've got my likes, I've got my comments, I've got a conversation going right. on that picture and the entire 98 of them. So much so that, you know, even today and while I was shooting that regularly, I promise you there were three or four people sending me chair pictures from around the world. It was one, you know, I had some 5,000 friends over there on Facebook. Saying, I saw this chair, it reminded me of you. Uh, of course, yes. <laughs> you know, for me, and since back you also took it up. For me, it was like, so therefore it's, it's done. You know? yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the, the state of photography in India. You've talked a little bit about how uh, the digital revolution has democratized uh, picture taking for a mass uh, number of people. You know, a great number of people now have iPhones or regular DSLRs, whatever it is, photography is is a huge uh, industry now in India. Mm -hmm. um, but but it seems to be that there's uh, the tendency to to almost follow along what the West has been doing. Do you feel, do you find though that there are people or there are trends within India? that are moving away and doing things that are really truly Indian in origin, Indian in, 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 in process or approach. Do you see what I'm saying? I think India is a country still trying to figure out is there an Indian approach, you know, <laughs> considering that, you know, uh, I always say that, you know, India is a continent which is pretending to be a country. Uh, so, therefore, they can, can they be, there's no Indian language, the Indian language is. Sure. There's no Indian religion, sure. the Indian religions, you know, right. so therefore, can there be an Indian photography uh, as far as that's concerned? Uh, does there need to be any, you know, particular nationalities photography anyway is a big question. But coming back to the context in which you're asking is that there is a very, you know, distinct Western way of uh, expressing through photography. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are trends which get created, which uh, I feel one is out of the creativity of the individual, but also then gets led by the cycle of commercialization of their interests, uh, which means that it has to be something that is saleable, which therefore, you know, galleries should like, 
and they would, you know, collectors should be able to buy it, etc. Uh, so, you know, that ends up, even if it doesn't seem so very overtly, but does, you know, I think affect the trend in photography at a particular time. And you'll, you'll, you'll see that, and I, I do study that uh, so, you know, as much as I can uh, you know, work on the internet. There is a certain kind of sameness to the kind of pictures, the kind of stories, or the kind of approaches which happen at a particular time. Uh, the same hasn't happened in India. What I find a bit disappointing in India is that not many people or not enough people seem to do enough personal work. Uh, for some reason, photography hasn't been a medium of self-expression as much as what it could have been. Mm-hmm. And if I might try and give you my amateur analysis of that, it's as long as film was there, uh, like I said, it was either the rich man's domain as a hobby or the working person's professional's domain because you could make a living off it. Along came digital and do that apart by putting a camera in every person's hand and every person's eye. Uh, and on the face of it, democratizing the entire process of creating photographs, right? I do believe that when something gets too democratized, it also, in terms of its value, it's kind of demeans itself. Uh, it's a, it might be a shocking statement to make, but the, you know, the exaltedness of the output gets diminished. Sure. Uh, that's happened. Two, very importantly, it's not just the process of creation which has changed with digital. Simultaneously came along the internet, which I, to my mind, probably made a bigger difference than the digital camera because the, the entire thing of sharing the fit picture became so easy mm-hmm. and so universal that unlike what I was talking about with, you know, with analog, where you had to buy the film, make the print and physically share it with someone, whether it's a friend or whether it's a gallery, whether it's a book. Right. Suddenly through Facebook and Flickr and what have you, you're instantly publishing your work ostensibly to a worldwide audience. You know, what happens then is that if your exposure is not just to 10 photographs per month, but to 10,000 photographs a month, how do you find those three great photographs in that? I think people's minds get numbed to the entire visual thing because there's such a mass of visual there. Absolutely. Uh, so, as far as India is concerned, we've gone really from photography being that hidden away medium, uh, which only a few practiced, and you know the most saw either as a photograph in the newspaper because galleries were again not something which everyone went to, etc. Through this explosion of everyone has pictures, everyone's making pictures, everyone's sharing pictures. You know, so it, there's not, not been a graduation, you know, gradual transition. Uh, so whereas literature, whereas dance, whether, you know, painting has gradually, you know, evolved and matured. Uh, photography's gone from, you know, very small to very large. Uh, which is not to say that they aren't enclaves, or they aren't cliques, or they aren't collectives of people uh, who practice photography as a means of expression and are doing very fine work. Uh, but then they, and this is my right, tend to you know be very you know close, uh, look at other people as not being good enough. Uh, you know, clubs get formed, mm. cliques get formed. Right. Uh, people with similar interests in the kind of work they want to do, or the kind of subjects they want to pursue. Uh, it's all that. Okay. That's what's happening. Um, is there... My last question to you, sir, is this... Uh, given the, the idea that there's more number of photographers now creating more number of pictures whether it's here in the U.S. or in India, and you've already said that the value of an image has come down. Uh, what is the future of a professional photographer? Is there a professional photographer in the future at all? Do you feel like people are going to go to a professional to have a, a, a professional photo- photograph taken of them? Or do you feel 
given that anybody can take a good picture now, supposedly, thanks to uh, technology mm -hmm. and thanks to the, uh, I guess, the democratization of, of, a, of the camera, uh, what happens to a photographer as a profession? You, are you worried about it at all? Uh, I won't say I'm worried about it, but yeah, I do wonder if it's, you know, okay, let me just, with a digital camera, whether it's a DSLR or a point and shoot or whether it's an iPhone camera, whatever it is, uh, anyone who is pointing at anything can be more or less assured of getting a competent photograph. And the competent photograph is not produced by the person who is clicking the camera, but by the software in the camera. Right, uh, And I want to make this distinction because, to my mind, a photograph, a good photograph, is made by the person and not the camera. The camera records. Absolutely. Uh, with film, you had to know the chemistry and the physics of light and the chemistry of the film and the emulsion to be able to produce mm -hmm. a competent photograph. Today, because the software does that for you, you don't have to know how to produce a competent photograph. It gets done in the black box. Uh, in the process of learning the physics and chemistry and producing that competent photograph, which took a few years, there was a rigor, which also then worked in sharpening your own vision to produce the good photograph and not just the competent. But if today, from the moment you walk into a camera shop and walk out of the camera and switch it on, you're able to take a competent photograph, the rigor of producing that good photograph is not. Yes. And that is the point which I try and make to my students. That just because the camera is recording a good, a competent photograph, if you're going to think that that's a good photograph, fine, you're done. Then why uh, carry on? But if you want to understand what makes a competent photograph a good or a great photograph, and that's composition, that's moment, that's lighting, then be a student of photography. Ah. Otherwise, you're a practitioner. Uh, everyone's a practitioner of photography, but a student of photography is a different person altogether. And a professional of photography is yet another one. But coming to the future of photography is a very, very valid question, and I don't have the answer, and which is what I tell my students also. That I can tell you of my experience of the last 30 years, I'll share my work with you, I'll tell you how I produce this. But if you want to look at my commercial model of how I made a living, and think that you can replicate that in the next 20 years, I'm sorry, forget it. Right. I'm not going to tell that lie to you. You need to go and invent that for yourself. I don't even know what it is. Right. But if I knew what it was, all right, then it's dated anyway. So you learn how to make a competent photograph into a good photograph for me, hopefully. Thereafter, how you monetize it, my friend, go find your own way. Wonderful advice. Just, and that's, that's what I tell people. Absolutely. That's wonderful advice, Dinesh. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate your time. I know it's been a busy one for you. And I look forward to chatting with you again, perhaps in New Delhi at the Delhi Photo Festival in a, about a year's time. You, you must make uh, time to come here. It's October 2015. Absolutely. Uh, it's bound to be a good festival. You know, what it's what we've done with the photo festival, it's not just the habitat now. Uh, with the second uh, festival, we also invited a number of cultural associations and galleries around Delhi. And we had about 20 such entities who had their own photo shows at the same time. Oh, wow. Uh, so, oh. you know, so it's just not just, uh, you know, a one venue uh, festival anymore. It's a city-wide one. So, the, you know, the amount of photography you get to see in the two weeks is actually incredible. So do come for that. And thank you so much for your time, and it's just a pleasure talking to you. I I know I've rambled a bit, but then that's what people at 58 tend to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's 30, 40 years of photography behind me, and I just absolutely. love talking. That's I an think absolute. of myself as a photography evangelist. Sure. You know, this is my legend, if I have any one. Sure, sure. Uh, absolutely. And anyone who is a believer in a particular faith, they tend to, you know, Talk a hell of a lot about it. Indeed. So forgive me for that. No, no, no problem at all. This is uh, this has been a very enjoyable, uh, almost an hour here, uh, forty-five minutes of, of chatting with you. I mean, how often do I get to do that? So thank you so much.
Take care. Thank you. You too. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.